The scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament reading of Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 31. <coughs> comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up on a, a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother's sheep. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span? and enclose the dust of the earth in a measure, and weigh the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has instructed him? Whom did he consult for his enlightenment? And who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Even the nations drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. See, he takes up the isles like fine dust. Lebanon would not provide fuel enough, nor are its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A workman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and casts it for its silver chains. As a gift, one chooses mulberry wood, wood that will not rot, then seeks out a skilled artisan to set up an image that will not topple. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them all like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, no one is missing. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even the youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Through these words, our God is still speaking. Thanks be to our still speaking God. It's nice to be back with you folks. Nice to be back. Bring a little normalcy back into an abnormal situation. <laughs> but you know, it's very, very frightening thing to be defenseless in a hostile world. It's indeed a horrible feeling to be completely helpless. When a person's sick, they run to the doctor hoping to be healed, but a doctor tries his best and says there's nothing else he can do, the sick person becomes hopeless. When a person has a serious financial problem, they run to their bank expecting to be bailed out. What they do when the bank insists that using assets they don't have is collapse. In the same way, the child is sick, they look to their parents for, for help and care. But how will a child feel if their parents tell them that the forces battling and against them are beyond their capability? It's a terrible thing to feel lonely and forsaken our relatives and loved ones. There may be some who have faced the worst times with no one to defend you. They say that just as a body of water can become stagnant, a person's life can also enter into a state of stagnancy. Stagnancy ultimately leads to a lack of productivity, barrenness, fruitlessness, indebtedness, poverty, failure, sorrow, and even disappointment. The good news is that there is help for the helpless and hope for the hopeless. You know, challenges come at us from many various different ways. They may include the limited to financial storms, Poverty, lack, sickness, marital burdens, stagnation, disappointment, marital troubles, and other conflicts. It may also be in the form of demonic yokes, afflictions, oppression, and any other general uh, generational problems. The truth is, we live in a fallen world. We'll always have problems. Jesus was perfect without sin. Or because he lived in a fallen world, Jesus himself faced a number of challenges which you have to deal with. And the great thing about Jesus is that he conquered and overcame every problem that we can imagine. Our passage today is not the normal liturgy for today. For some reason, the good Lord said, let's jump back in the Old Testament and let's pick up this passage, <clears throat> which I wrestled with. But it's a very Sublime passage of scripture in the Old Testament. It's a poetic description of soaring eagles. The Jewish people were in exile. It's likely that every one of them had looked up in the sky and seen these eagles soaring overhead, free. And how many times last year I wished I was one of them? <laughs> they cried out in their soul to the Lord to, to give them freedom of the eagles. They're beginning to doubt God cared for them. They definitely needed assurance that. God was still in charge. Did he care about his plight? Isaiah, the great prophet of the exile, was trying to give them encouragement. And so very eloquently, he said these words. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Their blessing God, the Lord, creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though your loose grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, 
Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. How many of you have ever been in a, a mood of weariness? God knows we're entitled to it at times. This is what the Jewish people felt in their exile. That's kind of why I guess he said, take this passage today. They were ready to give up. And Isaiah was telling them that the power and strength were available to them in a renewable form of soul power. Hopefully the way he would put them well along the way to running a successful race. They need to know that the key ingredient is to be able to win over the, their own weariness and, dis, and dis, discouragement. And this is what Isaiah gave them in this poetic expression of God's gift of courage. Your soul power is available to each and every one of us as it was to God's people next time. And this is what will win the race of life. How many of you watched the Olympics this past week? I wasn't going to, but once you get a peek at it, you know what? This can't get away from it. <laughs> the 3x3 on basketball with women, oh, I just couldn't. And I was getting ready for work, but I just couldn't get away from it. Athletes who participate in the Olympic Games know well the importance of, of hopeful waiting. There's a time when long hours are spent in practice, skills are honed, timing is perfected. All else a very a busy time for them. But it is waiting for the, the moment of performance, of hoping for the victory that the waiting has prepared them for. When I watched the 2020 Olympics, I, I listened as a world known gymnast pulled out of competition after the qualifying rounds because mentally she wasn't focused. Her mental state proved to be a huge challenge to her. She spent last year making all kinds of nude with her unbelievable talents in many different areas of gymnastics. And was seen as bringing home several gold medals this year. But, as a qualifying round, instead of trying to plow ahead and maybe seriously injure herself, with the moves she would need to win, she pulled out of competition. Simone Biles chose to face serious challenges in her ability to meet expectations of the world by being true to herself and stepping back at the same time supporting and encouraging the rest of the team and letting them shine. She took care of herself. She had been a team player. And she was true to herself. Others have seriously criticized her for this. Mainly because she didn't meet their expectations. It was hers that really meant a challenge. Eric Brower was a Reformed pastor, part of the Reformed Church of America. At one time, he was the General Secretary of the National Council of Churches. As a Reformed pastor, he was part of the Calvinistic tradition. Her issue is had the strongest emphasis on God's sovereign rule over the whole creation. It was a Calvinist, after all, who invented predestination to affirm that God is in control of everything. Every single move that we make is controlled by God. And then Harry got cancer. A terrible theological problem for us, any sensitive Christian. But I would think especially so for a Calvinist. And his son asked him about it in the most innocent way. What does faith mean for you now that you are facing this? Error responded by saying that he had believed in God all his life. And because he has cancer, there's no reason for him to stop believing in God. And his son said, but you and Mama spent a, a lot of your life trying to make this a better place for all people. This is a strange way to be paid back. And Eric said to his son, Steve, I don't believe that God wants me to have cancer. What I've come to believe during these days is that 
God can't do anything about it. And that raises some very fundamental questions for me and about what I have been taught and what I believe over the years about the almightiness of God. But if God can't stop this, then I have to come to some new understanding of God's almightiness. Or perhaps reject altogether. I haven't had time to think about it because I'm too busy dealing with all sorts of survival questions. But I'm going to work on it. And he did. He had a number of times God's almightiness is mentioned in the New Testament. He discovers only ten times. Nine of the ten are in the book of Revelations. The last book of the Bible. The vision of the end of history. He said, look at those texts that talk about God's almightiness. I discovered every one of them has to do with God's ultimate triumph in history. I say at the end of history, God's love, justice, and peace will prevail. And in history, God prevailed in the struggle. That now God is with us in the struggle. I say to myself, Eric, why in the world haven't you understood this before? We all know life's full of ups and downs. None of us have escaped it. If you have, oh my goodness, God bless you. <laughs> and you make me live. And one day you feel like you have it all figured out. It's all right here. You got it right in your hand in a moment. Life throws you a curveball. You're not alone in these days. Everyone has had to face their own set of challenges. And may still be facing their own set of challenges. We don't have to overcome challenges to help us to stay centered, remain calm under pressure. But then we're humans. And sometimes that pressure does overwhelm us. Everyone has their own preference of how to face a challenge in life. Every person in the world has their own low points. Some may handle them or even hide them better than others. But the truth is, whatever you're going through, there are others who have been through it too. You're not alone. Life demands as much courage and hopeful waiting for us as it does for an Olympic athlete. Life is a challenge of Olympic proportions demanding courage. Most of us express our courage in ways that are not in the spotlight. For example, a family who receives the, the word of cancer for a loved one finds the courage to go through the valley of the shadow. Or families who go through devastating infidelity and no humiliation and insecurity to, but manage to know that they don't stand alone. God does not grow weary. Rebellious teenager, the death of a spouse, or a deadly depression presents an unwanted opportunity to wait and hope the strength of the Lord to uphold and renew our courage. Life demands Olympic courage from each of us at different points in our lives. These encouraging words of Isaiah to God's people can be ours for living in these difficult days today. In verse 28, he assures the people that God has power. In the 29th verse, he says that God gives power to the faint and weary. God has power and gives power. Then the next verse, he says that we're wrong if we think that the power is, is with the, the young. Those who live under their own power break down. Nobody can make it under their own power. The challenges, the hurdles, the weights, and, and bars that we have to walk across like the gymnast are too tough for us to do alone. It's clear the message of the Bible that human beings cannot make it through life under their own power. Even the youth will grow weary, and the young people will only fall. Isaiah then moves into a rhapsody about waiting hopefully in the world. This is the kind of waiting that occurs while a mother waits on a baby to be born. Or like the farmer who has planted and sown and now he waits for the harvest. 
The same idea we find in Galatians. When Paul says, in the fullness of time, when time was present, Jesus came. It is a purposeful waiting. The root word means string, or rope, or cord. Have you ever said you're at the end of your rope? Or felt that way? That's where that comes from. And so we hold on to that rope, that cord, during the waiting time, knowing that the answer of God's coming. Frederick Peter Essex very wisely said that there is a right time for everything. God in His time will take care of it. This is why you wait to appropriate the future. The future response and answer becomes strength for life now. Faith is not a means by which you achieve victory. But living by faith, hopeful waiting, is victory itself. Victory is achieved when when we understand God's timing and live with hopeful waiting. How do you ever get up in the morning, look at a calendar, know the wind's in your face, and you feel, feel it before you put on your shoes? Do you feel like you're running through life? Do you think, I'm tired? My soul's tired? Isaiah says, that's when we will run and not grow weary. We will grow through life with God's strength. That last part of verse 31, they will run and not get tired. They shall walk and not get weary. There's an important placement of words here. We would probably have to have said that the phrase would be walk, run, soar. Instead he says soar, run, walk. All of us soar occasionally. We feel great. You know, you probably had that feeling when your loved one asked, were you married? And you said yes. Or when you found out a baby was coming. When you had a great new job. Or when your child was accepted his or her own college of choice. We soar at moments like that. We can't live with soaring all the time. Most of us can, walk, can run, but we get tired. The walk and not paint is where most of us find ourselves. Most of us do more walking than running. I'm talking about plodding through life. It can't always be soaring and running. It's mostly plodding. That's just the way life is. I found that in the church, too. Some Sundays we soar, some Sundays we run, and some Sundays we just walk. And they should have to start deeper. <laughs> but God is with us in the walking as well as in the running and the soaring. So what does this mean to your life and mine? Are you facing challenges of a living proportion? Are you coming to that, down to that point of life where there are challenges that you just don't want to face? What do you do? Well, first of all, you exchange your weakness for his strength. That's what our scripture for the Son is telling us. God is strength beyond our imagination. So we can exchange our weakness for his strength. And don't worry. God's big enough to handle our circumstances. So exchange weakness for strength and take one step at a time. The second thing we do is we wait patiently. And hopefully. That puts us in a process, the rhythm of God, which will bring peace. The last three weeks for me have been a challenge of a living proportion for sure. I haven't won a gold medal or even gotten near bronze. <laughs> I've been along pretty good until finally I had to admit that I'd become overwhelmed and exhausted. I kept trying to plod along. I couldn't have sorted if we put a jetpack on my back. <laughs> but the good Lord knew my plight and needed help.
Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait, and you can do it. That's what God reached out. Of his congregation. <coughs> Pick me up. And to at last be able to walk in it. With the comfort God from Isaiah to give. But he thanks that support, the encouragement. It's been a big help. You have a power through this challenge. To be able to support my wife more completely. If I still get more welcome at times, you bet I do. Writing this sermon wasn't easy. I had not started this sermon the way it did. I got halfway through it, and my computer locked up. I wasn't put down with God, thought I should, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't get it out. And because of that, he erased all I had done at that point. <laughs> I'm trying to get out. Very frustrating. Just one more thing. If I understand how the Jewish people in exile would scream out, Lord, what are you doing to me? <laughs> so I had to start again. So that's really a lesson. Just to support this congregation, lifts me up, encourages me to regenerate. Only each of you know what challenges you are carrying with you each day. I just say, exchange your weakness with the promised strength of God. Wait for the pregnant will of God to give birth in your circumstances. Receive the gift of wings and legs and of endurance. And live life one step at a time.